Nice. Um, let's talk about code reviews today. Um, welcome all for joining me. Also in the second room, I can't see you, but welcome for joining me. I heard that the second room is also packed, so officially next year I'm going to speak on the main stage. <laughs> Um, you can tweet about this with uh, PHP UK conference, my Twitter handle, and PHP UK 17. Uh, so my name is Hannes, um, and I can describe myself in a couple of emojis, or emoji, that's the official plural. I can describe myself with the Belgian flag. I like to swim, I like to cycle, I like to run, and I also love working with computers. I love making digital products. The last one isn't really an emoji, but it's the company logo. I work for a company called Made With Love. It's a Belgian company, but we're a remote company, so we also have people in France, Brazil, Canada, um, basically all over the world. Well, not in the eastern side of, or not, not to the east of Europe, but mainly to the west. Um, we do PHP and JavaScript development for clients. It could be a government, could be a startup, could be anything. Um, but we're here to talk about code reviews, of course. Um, so what is a code review? Let's first outline the subject a bit. Um, a code review is someone who wants to make a code change, um, but he, doesn't, um, he isn't allowed to make it straight to production. So what he or she does is make a couple of changes and show it off to a peer, another programmer or someone else inside the company or outside the company, it doesn't matter. Um, showing your code before it gets merged to other environments like uh, staging or production. That is a code review. Um, who can do the code review? Someone else inside the company. Could be a consultant outside of the company. Um, could be the CTO. Could be another junior dev. Could be anyone, basically. Not all code reviews have to be done by the CTO or the lead developer. Um, so what does it look like? You push some changes uh, to GitHub or to Bitbucket, whatever you want. Um, and someone else is going to re review that. He or she is going to look at the commits, look at the individual lines that have changed, and provide some feedback. Right? It's a feedback loop. Based on that feedback, the programmer will reply to some answers, uh, make, uh, yeah, reply to some questions with some answers. Why did I do this? Why did, do it? did, I, why did I do that? Um, and maybe uh, also push some more commits to fix stuff. And that's a circle. So it's a basic feedback loop. Um, if you make the feedback loop fast enough, it feels like pair programming, actually. So in the end, uh, the reviewer will say, oh, well, this is finally in a stage state that I want to merge this into develop branch or master branch and mush, push, push it out to um, staging or production. So that is approving. Um, not everyone has the luxury to work in a team with multiple people. So you can also do a code review or your own code. Um, before committing code, you can do git add-p to review individual chunks of changes before you actually commit them. So that's also pretty useful. It's a one-man show or one-woman show. Um, you can also work with git branches and GitHub and make your own uh, pull requests before merging them if you're a uh, if it's a one-woman show or a one-man show. Um, basically, you review your own, your own code in a different environment, on a different screen than your IDE. That's also useful. But that helps with pointing out some failures or some flaws in your own code. Um, but why would we spend some time on that? Why wouldn't we just push to production? And If it works on my machine, it works on production, right? Um, well, basically, um, before... Before I uh, started doing this talk, I was at a meetup um, and I was talking to some person and the person wasn't happy with his current workplace. Um, and basically everything he said, why he hated working there, was because they didn't do code reviews. The code style sucked, um, people were pushing things to production, production would break, um, more senior developers would revert changes every time uh, when someone else had pushed something to master. Um, there was no communication between the developers. So basically everything he said that he hated about the company was because they didn't do code reviews. So it is pretty useful to spend some time on that. It's not a waste of time. Um, for the person that is submitting the code, it is useful because 
they can learn from their peers. They get feedback on their, on their code. Maybe there's a better way to do this. Maybe there's a different design pattern that better suits this situation. As a submitter of a code review, you also start to feel more responsible for the product. You first have to show your code, what you did, your changes, to your peers. It's everyone, coding is a craft, so everyone likes to put out the, their best effort and show it off to their peers. Look what I did. You start to feel more responsible for the product and for the code that you're putting out. You're taking pride in the code that you craft. It's also useful for the, the peers that are reviewing the code. I do maybe 15 hours a week on code reviews, and I still learn every week. PHP has so many functions, I still learn new functions every week. I still learn new things or creative ways of doing, uh, of, of crafting a solution. I, ca I can still learn from the most junior devs in, in my company and, and in other companies that we work for. Um, it also, it's also useful because I may not be working on some features that my peers are working on, and I still want to know how, that's, how that is built. I can still learn from that, because maybe in two weeks' time or six months' time, I will be working on the same features, and I want to know up front how it's built. I don't have to know, but I like to know, because coding is a craft. So it's useful as a reviewer, too. It's also useful for management. So if you go back to your company and you go to your manager and you say, I want to do code reviews. Well, this is why. It raises the level of both your juniors and your seniors. They both learn from each other. It's making your team more coherent. They, they start to work better together. Um, it also raises product awareness about, about all the features. How do features work? How are they built? If, if someone leaves the company in two weeks' time that, and the person has built a new feature three weeks ago and someone else has to take over but you didn't do code reviews, it's going to be a hell of a task to look into the code that no one has ever seen. If you, do, if you had, would have done code reviews, it's easy. Just jump in and you've, you've already seen this code. Um, so it, it, it generates better code. Um, you get some feedback loop and you improve the code before actually merging it. So better code means more maintainable code, which means easier addition of new features. That's what bosses like, right? Some PHP CEO <laughs> likes to tweet uh, capital stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is not really good. It's, it's better to do less deploys and have a feedback cycle before pushing to production. So, what should you do when you're making a pull request, right? It's not as easy as git commit, git push, click create new pull request, it's a bit more. First. You get a task assigned, right? Build a new feature, remove a feature, um, adjust a feature. Read the task. What is expected? Ha plan a meeting with, with a product owner or uh, wh whoever made, it, made that task. Ask, ask them some questions. What is expected? Uh, how should this work? Uh, is this a filter with a, with a slider? Is this just a plain text field? How will this look like? What is expected? What, what do I need to make? Do I need to make a Gaussian curve filter or just plain text search? Um, that's, you know, make, do some analysis, do, do some research uh, before you actually start making the code. Um, then, when you start the code, test first, right? Um, make a test, what is expected, an integration test, um, that's easy. Make sure that the test fails, and then start coding your way. Well, that's the best practice, but I admit I don't always do TDD. Um, 
Right, so you made your test. Commit the test. Um, make it go to CI. See it fail. Cool. It fails. And then add some more tests, some, some more commits. Um, like add a new endpoint, uh, rename a variable, make a new CLI command, um, test the backup, um, remove some conditionals, uh, make some if-else statements disappear by using a better way of coding, do some solid design, uh, remove something. Um, do some code style fixing. Make that a separate commit each time. Everything you do is a separate commit. Um, about commit messages, I can go on and on about that um, for another hour, but after this it's lunch, right? So I won't do that. Um, basically what I do is I think this commit and then I continue writing what my commit message is. This commit fixes the code style. This commit renames this variable. I don't write this commit, but I do write the rest. So that's my that's my format of doing commit messages. Yours might be different, but that's okay. Um, so you made all the commits, and then you push it to GitHub or Bitbucket, and then you want to compare the changes to the the base branch, develop maybe, or development. And then you hit create new pull request. There's a big form here. Use that. It's useful. Uh, create a beautiful title. What does this do? Right? Um, it, this adds this new feature, uh, some brief title. And then use the big box below, the, des the description, pull request description, to fill out all the details. You want to properly document this PR. Write a change log, right? Um, I removed this variable, I removed that feature, I added an endpoint, um, I re-enabled uh, backups, if you're a GitLab. Um. <laughs> a link to the assigned issue or the task. The person that is going to review your, your PR will want to know why you did this. Why, why did you uh, add this endpoint? Um, so the person that is reviewing your code can actually click that and go see what the assignment was. And then use that in the, in the, in the back of his, his or her head to review your code. Is this okay? Is this in line with the expectations? Um, and then below the change log, also add some uh, description about the decisions you made. Why did you use this design pattern? Or why did you use this composer package, right? Um, so that it doesn't have to be rediscussed afterwards, so that the, the reviewer doesn't have to um, add a lot of questions. Why did you use this? Or why did you rename this variable to i instead of index? Um, something like that. And then, last step to the right, assign some reviewers, one or more. Right? Could be yourself, could be someone else, could be multiple people. Right, so that's your pull request, great. Um, but I also t uh, s said something about code style, uh, and I want to give you a brief um, intermezzo about code style. Um, we all know PSR2, right? Um, we all know that, well, you may not know, but soon there's also PSR12 with some PHP 7 syntax stuff. Um, and there's also Symfony code style, which is what we use in our company. Um, this code style actually extends PSR2 with some extra rules. Um, and on top of that, we even add some more rules. It's open source, so you can look it up. Um, we add some more rules to make it easier to review some code. I'm going to give you some examples, and then you say left or right. Which one, which of the diffs, code diffs, is easiest to review? Okay, first one. Which is the easiest? Left, correct. Why? Maybe the green isn't so clear. Yeah, smaller diff. So it just says, I added one line. The right, the diff on the right is exactly the same, but there wasn't a trailing comma here. So we added the multi-line array trailing comma rule to our rule set of code styles because it makes it easier to review code. If you look at the left one, you see, oh, 
one line has been added. If you t take a look at the right one, it says oh, one ha line has been removed and then you add a two. But what does this functionally change? It's easier to see uh, the left one, the, the functional changes in the left one, compared to the right one. And that is what you want as a reviewer. You want to see the functional changes. You don't care about the code style, you care about the functional changes. That is what your task is, to see what the functional changes are and to give feedback on that. Next example, which one is the easiest? The right one, right? Um, a lot of people like to align stuff in their IDE, so it's easier to read in columns. Um, but if you change one key of this JSON, for example, then you might need to reorder in the entire column. And that makes it harder to review. Sometimes you have files with 300 entries in a JSON file, and it's super hard to see what the actual difference is. If you change one key and you make a super long key, and then you have to reformat the entire file, it's super hard to spot what the single line that caused the change is. So forget about the alignment. Just do this. Uh, do PHP doc params, uh, disable it. Um, that would uh, align the PHP docs, uh, doc block. Um, also disable the align double arrow, uh, disable the align equals, because that will, if you assign stuff with an equal sign, that would al um, align all the equal signs. I hate that, I hate that. As a reviewer, I can't stand that. It's hard to see what has actually changed. Um, next one is braces. Which one is easiest to read? The right one, right? The left one didn't have changes uh, um, have a code block after the if statement. So if it's a one line uh, if block, you can actually drop the, the curly braces, but it's hard to spot what, what has actually changed. Okay, this dark green bit helps a bit, but it's not, it's not enough. It's super easy to see that, oh, you added one subscriber here. That's it, super easy. Same for constructors, you can new up a new item without using the braces. Just use new with braces, uh, code style rule. If you use that, you actually enforce uh, the use of the braces. And this one, everyone likes this one, right? It's at the end of a file when you don't have a new line after the last empty line. It says, no, GitHub says no new line at the end of a file. And this week I saw this at a client. They do slash, 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 four slashes, I don't know why, end of file, no new line. It's, it's crazy. Just use PSR2, add some more rules, if you like, and add that to your CI, CI check uh, so that everyone has their code style um, enforced. And it makes uh, code reviewing code easier. So what should, um, this is the end of the intermezzo, what should a reviewer do? Uh, first, we talked about what should the submitter do. What should the reviewer do? Well, first, the don't. Just don't bash about code style. Make it an automated tool. Make it a check in CI. Use a linting tool. Enforce it. It's not easy if you're working with a legacy code base, but um, try to work towards a uniform code style. Um, Another thing you don't have to check as a, as a reviewer is, is this code mergeable? GitHub will tell you if it's not mergeable. It will tell you if, the, if there are conflicts. So that's something you don't have to worry about. Um, don't complain about duplicated code. Two lines of duplicated code isn't bad. If it's readable, if it's, clear, it's more clear, then just leave it. Use some automated tools to report duplicated code. It's okay if, if there's two lines of duplicated code. Just use scrutinizer CI or something to notify, to, to notify you about it, but don't start uh, commenting on code, like make an abstract function for this. It's not, it's not necessary. If it's readable, it's okay. Just keep track of your technical depth. Use scrutinizer CI, use Travis CI, uh, use uh, C CS fixer linting tools, whatever, ESLint. Whatever you want, 
just use all those tools uh, to make your job as a reviewer easier. If CI says that something is not in, on par with company standards or project standards, then the CI tools will tell you. So basically, everything that's automated, you shouldn't do that as a, that's a don't. Um, one last thing that's not automated um, is discussing the issue. The person that has submitted the PR should already have discussed that. As, uh, that person should al already have um, the discussion and the questions and the why is this, uh, uh, what, what, what should this look like? You don't have to rediscuss that. Basically, uh, in an ideal world, the, the submitter of the code will already have done that. Um, if you see that the submitter of the code didn't ask enough questions, close the PR and say, please rediscuss this because I, I, I'm pretty sure that this is not what is expected. So, what you should do as a reviewer is look at the PR. Look at the description, the change log, um, the, the design decisions. Um, l go to the linked issue as well to see what was expected and what is discussed. If you read that first and then you look at the code, you will easily spot that s when something is not um, implemented the way it should. And then you can say, maybe go back to the project manager or the product owner to rediscuss the, the, the design of the feature. Um, after that, you go look at the code and you look for things like the naming of variables, the naming of methods. Yeah, you look at design patterns. Are they implemented well? Um, do the correct classes implement the correct interfaces? Stuff like that. That's something that cannot be automated. Um, there's no AI system yet that can detect design patterns. If someone ever invents that, then we're all out of jobs. <laughs> um, look at the clarity of the code. Is it readable? When you have to continue developing that feature in two or three months' time, will you be able to step in and start progressing? Is it clear? Um, Sometimes code is just too creative. Sometimes, um, one example, um, we had to use slugs in a URL, um, but the slug had to be unique, so when it's not unique, we just add dash two, dash three, dash four, until it's unique. Um, and there was a while loop which um, decremented an index. And I said, don't you want to increment, like, from one to two, to three, to four. And then I noticed that there was no concatenation of the dash. And then after 15 minutes of tinkering, what does this code do? I found out that actually um, the, the index decremented to minus two, minus three, and that was converted to a string and appended to the slug. <laughs> That's just too creative. I had to think about that for 15 minutes to figure out how it, it, it was implemented. It's crazy. So I stepped in and I said, it's not really clear. Maybe just make it super clear, add a dash, and then add the, the string version of the int. <coughs> anyway, um, so it needs to be clear. clear. Um, ask some questions uh, if something is not clear, uh, like, uh, why did you name it like this and not use a st st um, static factory method or something? Um, always be asking questions. Even if, um, you know, just asking questions. Uh, the, the, the answer to the question can be uh, a valid reason for doing stuff like this. Could be, uh, the, the answer to the question could be, oh, I don't know, I just implemented it like this, but maybe it Another way is better. Uh, so uh, questions can still go both ways. Um, it's better than saying, you should do it this way, or uh, you should do it that way. Because if you ask a question, there might be a, a valid reason behind it, behind the decision. Um, also look at 
so we looked at naming and stuff. Uh, we should also look at uh, missing migrations. Will this deploy to production automatically? Um, will this cause any failures in Redis or something? Um, maybe we should clear cache when we deploy this. Stuff like that. That's something that AI cannot do yet. Um, then, when the cycle is complete and you approve this pull request, um, you should give some credits. Give a thumbs up. Well done. Um, add the ship emoji, or a, a ship that's being uh, shipped off. Um, some some GIF or something. Make it funny. Make it cheerful. Give some credits. Like uh, I'm glad we finally can merge this. Uh, good job. Um, also ab about the questions. Um, if you have some questions and you're discussing some some decision, um, maybe link some articles or blog posts. Could be useful. Uh, could be that this person or that person doesn't know this design pattern, or uh, or doesn't know a command bus. Just link uh, an article about command buses. It's uh, it's a way of l educating the person without having to type an entire blog post in a pull request. Um, so. The reviewer, uh, the submitter, has also been putting the effort in to make some atomic commits. So you can actually use this. Go to the previous commit and the next commit. I hate that this previous just jumps to the right. <laughs> OCD, you know. Um, if the reviewer has been putting in the effort to make atomic commits, you can use this to look at how this person has been implementing this. Take it step by step. It's like pair programming, but delayed. Um, if you're reviewing code um, and you've been uh, giving feedback on a person's uh, pull request, you should also mind your language. Language is important. Um, I already said that you should be using some GIFs or some emojis, thumbs up, ship. Um, it makes it more cheerful. Um, also, give some credit when, when, you, when you learn something new. If you see a function and you never heard about that function and it's super smart to use that function in this situation, just say so. I learned something new, thanks. Give compliments. Um, use a GIF. Like, yep, yeah, looks good to me. <laughs> or if it's a super huge PR with 500 commits, and you finally managed to ship it. <laughs> I feel sorry for the cameraman or a woman. Ouch. Um, so language. Language is important. Um, when you're reviewing some code, um, make it less personal. Just step away from the person that has been putting out the code. You don't have to say, oh my, oh my god, I'm a big fan of your code. Fanboying is not really at, at uh, it's not for this situation. Um, so, um, another thing I like to do when a, a pull request is ready to be shipped, but you have some s small amount of time left, then I ask maybe add this one more thing, just go one step further. Give it the extra 1%, just to see how far you can stretch the person, how far you can make this person go, go to making the perfect code. On the other hand, if time is pressing um, and the code works, there's some uh, issues with it, some naming things, but basically it works, let it go. Just make it ship. It's also fine. Just depending on the time on the, or the the time till the deadline, um, make your code reviews um, change a bit. If you have some extra time, push for better code. If you don't have enough time, let go of some principles and uh, ship the code. Um, has anyone heard about the lizard brain? I see a few nodding heads. Okay. Um, the lizard brain is basically one of the oldest parts of our brain, 
we inherited that from the lizards, like uh, alligators and stuff. I don't know much about lizards, but um, basically, uh, the lizard brain is a thing that acti activates our offensive mode when we get attacked. So when we get attacked, we fight back. It's an old part of our brain that does that. Um, and basically, you can trigger that by using the, the wrong words. Um, if you say something like, do you even know this design pattern? Um, do you even know how to write JavaScript? That's offensive, and people fight back. Um, so mind your language. You're working with people. You don't want to offend them. They're, they're your peers. You will have to work with them maybe for a long time. So better be friends with your peers and use some suggestive language. Instead of saying you, make it about yourself, right? Um, for example, um, you, you see a pull request and you know that some things can be better. Um, use some suggestive language like I would maybe uh, think about mm, something, uh, you know, make it about you and say, I would, or I feel like if we, if we figure out a way to do something like that, um, use maybe a lot, or, uh, or would, or what do you think about this? Make some suggestions and then ask for their opinion instead of saying, uh, instead of enforcing stuff. Uh, so yeah, that's suggestive language. Um, don't trigger their lizard brain. Uh, the next thing, this is a compound emoji. That's not a real one. It's called the shit sandwich. You know, when you have to give feedback to a person, better wrap it up with something nice. <laughs> you might be giving some hard words or maybe touch their feelings, but better uh, start off soft, right? Soft bun on the bottom. Say, like, uh, it looks like it works. Good job. You've been putting in a lot of time and effort in this. But there's the next layer, the shit layer. <laughs> it's so funny. Um, I'll, t I'll tell you this later. Um, so go to the next layer and then give the feedback. What do you think about uh, that class? Maybe change it to s a factory, or I don't know. Maybe we, we or um, there's already something in this project that can do that instead of rewriting stuff. So maybe what do you think about using this class instead of writing your own? Um, what do you think? Again, use some suggestive language there, um, and then after the feedback. Return to the first soft layer. You want a soft bun to top it off with some sesame seeds or something. Um, <laughs> say something other suggestive like, uh, maybe if you work with this or that person, I'm pretty sure that we can collectively finish this off and ship this code and then move on to other things. That's topping it off with a soft bun. So st start off soft, give the feedback, Use suggestive language there. You don't want to uh, trigger their lizard brain, and then top it off with something nice again, right? So that is um, how I like to give feedback. And the funny thing is, um, once you know this technique, you start to notice when someone else uses it. <laughs> so that's uh, sometimes it's like, wait, did you just? <laughs> uh, but it's okay. It's okay. It's um, they know how to give good feedback. It's, it tells you something about them instead of tell you so telling us something about you did wrong. Um, and then last but not least, um, we're running ahead of schedule here, but you'll be first in the lunch queue. Um, this box, it's about merging. It's the last step of a pull request. Um, who do you think should merge a pull request? the one that has been reviewing the code, or the one that has been putting out the, the effort. I see some nodding heads at both sides. 
Um, basically, what we feel is, it's, it's personal, um, we work with a remote team, and some people might be working uh, in the PM while we are already asleep in Europe. Um, basically, whoever presses the button and triggers the deploy to staging has to be um, has to be comfortable fi fixing the deploy or fixing the, the incoming bugsnack errors. Because you don't want the staging to be down or a, a test environment for the client to test to be down when someone who actually can fix it is sleeping. You don't want to call other people uh, in their sleep. Um, there's also this little link here, command line instructions. That's also pretty useful. Uh, before merging it, you might consider pulling in the code locally and test it out, right? Uh, it's not only for QA engineers to test out stuff. Uh, you m it's useful to merge this code locally and check it out before merging it into development. So, um, wrapping up here, um, code reviews are nice. Um, they're useful for your entire team, your entire company. It's not a waste of time. Um, as a submitter, I would like to urge you to review your own code before committing it or before sending in a pull request. You might catch some stuff before someone else catches it, maybe a lost far dump or something. Um, automate as much as possible. Put uh, some more linting tools in CI, uh, some more testing, environment, uh, testing tools, uh, smoke tests, whatever. Um, Maybe a, uh, I just thought about this, maybe some um, uh, fakes, fakes on deploy. It's also useful. You can uh, do Capistrano uh, deploy without actually doing it. Um, so reverting right, uh, right before you move the sim link. Um, give some valuable feedback, uh, but stay positive. Don't touch their lizard brain. Uh, try to use suggestive language and, of course, the shit sandwich. If you see the si shit sandwich being used against you, don't be offended. It's just uh, well played. Um, <laughs> now, I would like to all of you to go to your teams, go to your bosses, spread the, world, spread the word, um, give some good feedback, and learn from your peers. That's it. Thank you. There's a joined in link here. Please give me feedback. Uh, it's been a bit short, but okay, you'll be the first in the lunch queue. Give some feedback to other spe speakers as well. Um, something a lot of people <coughs> don't know is you can also give feedback to the conference organizers. That's also useful for them. Um, you can give feedback to them and come back next year to a better conference. I would like to answer some questions now. There's a mic in this room and a mic in the other room. I want to answer one question at least from each room. So, um, as Hi. a code reviewer, you can give quite factual um, comments like, this is how I would have done it, or things like that, which um, sometimes being code reviewed, people can get really offended. They can take it personally when, of course, it's just about, it's about the code. But uh -huh. they kind of feel, oh, you're saying that I'm a terrible developer. How do you explain to them that it is just about the code, that you do it to someone who was 20 times more experienced and that you get this feedback and it's just factual and mm -hmm. that you still think that they're a great person without mm -hmm. them still feeling, uh, yeah, but you said that I was wrong. You can still make them feel valuable if you append a little question. What do you think? Make, uh, make, it, uh, make it a discussion about two equal developers. Every developer is equal in my, in my eyes. Um, yeah, use suggestive language, add the question, and that removes 90% 90, 90 of the offensiveness of a feedback sentence. Does that answer your question, or? Mostly, but in a case where, uh, I think, in a case where they do do something that's wrong, mm -hmm. which is fine, you can say, like you can oh, yeah. say that you've done some other great stuff, but they still pick up that point that is objectively wrong. Um, and you can't necessarily make that a discussion. Is there a way of just like a really simple way of explaining to them, like, don't take it personally? Like, is there just any advice that you have for just saying uh, it's maybe it's cool, dude. back up your 
arguments with facts instead of fake news. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Alternative facts. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know, give some documentation and cool. make it a, a joint effort. Um, and yeah, just try to argument your case as well as possible. And then maybe you can figure out. If, if not, you, uh, another thing you can do is bring in a second um, opinion by someone else who's okay. not opinionated or biased. Cool. That's something else you can do. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. thanks. More questions? In the other room? Uh, no? Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> you want some water? Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, is there, a, in terms of reviewers, are, are there a, is there an optimal amount of reviewers? Yeah, are there too many reviewers? Can you have too, too many? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I'm concerned about the feedback loop, right? So you, you have, F five uh, reviewers on a, on a pull request. Yeah. One says yes, the other, second one says yes, third one says no, let's Locking. do some, uh, yeah. exactly, let's do some uh, refactoring on this. Uh -huh. It goes back into that cycle again. Yeah, um, there are some projects where we do one reviewer, there are some projects where we do three reviewers, depends on the client, depends on the project. Um, and I noticed that if you have three reviewers or more, um, the list of open pull requests only get longer and longer because some pull requests are being blocked by one person, uh, m mostly me, but uh, <laughs> who has always has more arguments or things that need to change. So I don't know if there's an optimum. I think that's something you have to figure out yourself. For me, I think two is, is pretty optimum. Does that answer your question? Yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, yeah, there's no right answer there's to no that, right? right. Amount. But um, yeah, just wondering if too many is. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. But that's good. That's great. Thanks. All right. More questions? Yes. Oh, in the back. Hi. Oh, so can you not see me? Um, that was a that was a really uh, great talk. Um, okay. I run a small team of developers. <laughs> And to just <laughs> to make a point on the, the lizard brain issue um, uh -huh. that the lady brought up over there, the one way we've got around that lizard brain issue is we have like a what we call a code standard, but it's like basically a, just a, what? a code standard. Okay. So it's just a basic list of rules uh -huh. that the team um, all agrees to. So it's abstracted responsibility away from the individual code reviewer. Yeah. So, for instance, like there's things like every method must have a comment. Oh yeah. So if my junior developer goes so and submits something without a comment, mm -hmm. I just go, Hector, change that. And yeah. there's no argument. The team has agreed to that. Yeah, that's something we do as well. We have some regular discussions. Like right after this talk, I have a call about deployments and stuff, and then we have a team discussion, and then we make up some rules, write them down, and then when someone on news comes in someone new comes in, um, they have to read all the rules, which is a bit cumbersome, but yeah, and we can always refer to that when we have discussion again about something. So my actual question is, do, would you agree that like a code review isn't about the here and now? That you can't, it's not about improving code right now, because essentially if you subscribe to the idea that all code is terrible, uh -huh. which it generally is, um, you, can't, you can't really fix it at that precise moment. What it's about, that the code review process is about what you touched on to begin with, which is the c getting the team to start talking to each other yeah. and start learning from each other. And indirectly, that should increase the quality of code over time. But the like an individual team. review uh -huh. won't fix much more than mm -hmm. a missing comment or something like that. Yeah, correct. I agree. Uh, okay. Sorry, was, it, was there a question? That was kind of, I was wondering if that's what you agreed with. That was I, I agree. Okay, okay simple then. <laughs> what, I, I agree. I agree there's too many fake news. All right, more questions? Yes, I see two more hands. Um, earlier you talked about how you browse through atomic commits sometimes. 
Uh, yeah. What are your thoughts on that versus squashing a whole merge request, all the commits together? Because <laughs> sometimes with like a, a large code base, if you're going back in time, you want to know why I, a change was made. It's uh -huh. easier when it's I squashed. only squash commits when I have something to hide. <laughs> Like a missing or a leftover var dump or console the log, then I squash some commits. But otherwise, I I don't rewrite history. Uh, it's always useful to see why something changed, and then you can look at the commit message, and then see the surrounding commits before and after. So I, I I'm not a big fan of squashing commits, but it's a, a personal thing. You can have a different opinion, of course. Sorry. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. yeah it does. Thanks. Um, I had one more. Hi, uh, sorry, we have a small team, so we never do code review actually, like three of us, but uh, but we want to start. What's the best point to start it? Like, what's the best place to start code review? Do you use GitHub or Bitbucket? Yeah, we use GitHub. Easy. Start oh. using branches, that's yeah, step we, one. Well, we do. And then start with small pull requests, like changing a config file or something, and then let someone else take a look at it. <coughs> instead of pushing it straight to develop. Do you already use uh, Git branches? Yeah, yeah, we have like staging, live. Uh -huh. You can also, you know, um, a, a PR is basically a diff between two branches. So you already have that. You can already start right now. Start small with some small pull requests. And then try to, do you have the phenomenon of uh, everlasting branches that are never being merged, like big branches that uh, are a few months old and you can't get them merged. We only we only have like three branches and just developer branch merge to staging and then staging goes to production. Oh, okay. So each of us has mm -hmm. his own developer branch. Oh, and then it goes to one staging uh -huh. and then goes. Um, but we all have access to each other's branches. Do you ever um, get into a situation where um, someone wants to continue working, um, but also wants their code being merged, and then they make a de second develop personal develop branch, right? Yeah. Because they want to, you know, you know how Git works. Yeah. Uh, you append more commits, and then this is the commit that you want to merge into develop but you want to continue working on the same progress, right? Then you can branch off from that again and then make that a pull request and continue working on something else, right? We, we can have a discussion later. I have a call for work, but after that, we can always have a discussion. Cool, thanks. Maybe tonight with some beers. One more question? I think we have one more question. Two more. Do you do any part of the code review uh, offline, just face to face or on the phone or something like that? Because we're a remote team, no. But I, s I can definitely see the value in that. Mm. Um, going back to the issue with the difficult bits, we tend to do the uh, mm -hmm. criticizing bits offline and then yeah. keep when it all off. So is it when something is crucial or important that you want to do a, a add more developers to review a code review? Uh, just trying to follow the sort of criticize in private, praise in public routine. So if there's something where, yeah, this pr code is pretty bad, oh, but I don't want to say mm -hmm. that in front of everyone on Git because oh, the if whole if you thing. Um, decouple the critiquing from the person that you're giving critique to, then you can do public uh, feedback instead of criticizing privately. We, d we never criticize privately, actually. Does that kind of answer your question? Or yeah. am I still on? Yeah, it's just interesting. It's just we have a rule that if um, you say Could something be. and then the uh -huh. other person says, no, I disagree, it <laughs> should be how I've done it. We just instantly have a rule to say, okay, let's take it offline. I was just wondering if you had any kind of processes around that where someone disagrees with the critique. Uh, I can't really comment on that because we, uh, it's a bit bragging, but we have a great team, so we don't have that situation. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, but 
everyone's, any jobs. <laughs> everyone's uh, way of doing pull requests is different, and everyone's way of giving feedback is different. So uh, you can have different ways of doing it, definitely. Thank you. Do you have any standards about how much changes or updates are allowed into a pull request? N no hard rules or standards, but uh, we do uh, give comments on pull requests that are too large or are dragging on too long. So there's no hard rules for us, but we do notice them. Do you have some tool or something to do that? No, but just just from experience, when you when they're, they're small, it keeps things ticking over. Uh -huh. and then every now and again, a huge one comes in, and mm -hmm. then there's updates. You've got to go back in. You're wasting more time going in, yeah. out, in, out. Uh -huh. So we generally try and avoid them. And I'm just curious from your own experience. You Sometimes I, uh, when you see the list of pull requests, I reverse the list and see the oldest one first, and then I go in and say, is this still necessary? If not, close it. If yes, uh, require some action within one week or something. That's something you can do as well. So to reduce the list of <coughs> old, inactive pull requests. Does that answer your question? Yeah, fine. Okay. More? One more. I think other people want lunch, but... Um, my question is, um, how would you solve the problem when there is a difference in opinion about the implementation, but uh, not necessarily the code is bad or... I, I would bring in a third person to oh. and have a team discussion about, like he said, um, bring the team on par so that we all agree on some standards and some ways of doing things. Um, of course, you don't have to endlessly do, endlessly do that and do it with every single uh, little nitpicking thing, but... No, it's, it's personal. You you can choose. Uh, I I don't, I don't have a proper way of answering that question. Is that we c we can still discuss afterwards. More questions? One more. Hi. Do you have any advice on how to deal with people who can't help but be offensive with their comments? <laughs> <laughs> Then I would go privately and say, maybe this comment is a bit snarky and maybe you should watch your language because you don't want other people to, that, to do that to you. Maybe go higher up to the CEO or something. I don't know. All right, I think we can have lunch now. Cool, thanks. <laughs>